All right, class, it is time to get started. It's February 13th, and uh, it's a new week in our graduate research and design class. This week's topics are survey and correlational research. One thing I wanted to do was to add a little bit of an, uh, off, uh, an element to this class by having some online office hours. And so this week uh, we have online office hours Wednesday at 11 to 12.30 p.m. So I'll be online. You can use this link and just click on that and you can log into the system that we have. There's an online system where you can chat to me or you can talk to me with a microphone on your computer. And if you have any questions or comments or anything that you want to talk about, that's a good time to do it. But of course, if you have questions and, and other comments and so forth, you can always email me like uh, many of you have been doing throughout the semester. But that, I thought, would just be another opportunity for interaction that might add a little bit to this class. Um, you'll want to look at the Preparing for Research Activity Assignment. Um, Dr. Moon and I are doing a research study entitled Elementary School Teachers Technology Self-Efficacy. And there's a few descriptions there. There is the, the IRB form that's approved now. Um, Institutional Review Board Form is what that stands for, and basically uh, any research that you do, as you have learned about in your city certification, you have to have it reviewed by a board that um, makes sure that your research is done according to ethical standards and guidelines. And so that's the that's an ap actual application to the Northern State University IRB, which was just recently approved. Now, as graduate research and design students, there is an assignment that is called the Research Activity Assignment, and you'll need to take part in a part of this research study in order to do this assignment. And so I've got some different tasks that uh, various students can do. I already have the first two done, or at least beginning. Develop and place the online the survey instrument in Google Forms and collect current email addresses for Aberdeen School District teachers. So those tasks have been uh, taken and they're in progress at this point. But uh, I do need someone still to work on an interview question protocol and to interview and transcribe individual teachers and principals at uh, MME, meaning Mike Miller Elementary School, following a script and then writing the emails and follow-up emails for different activities. So this is survey research, actually which fits in with the topic for this week, right? Survey research. We're using, well, not all of it's survey research. Some of it's interviews as well. And uh, that's a qualitative inf interviewing or a research method. So anyway, we're going to use a survey. We're going to do interviews, and we're going to collect other data that we already have to try to determine our impact as we hold classes out at Mike Miller Elementary. Um, and we've been doing that for a couple of semesters now, I guess. Well, actually, no, this is the second semester of that initiative. And so we want to see what our impact is on teacher self-efficacy with technology, if any. All right, so that's the idea. Um, well, take a look at those activities. I'll probably, I do need one more for the previous activities or for the preliminary activities. And then I can probably get the rest, or if not most of you, to do interview, an interview with an individual teacher or principal at Mike Miller Elementary School. And so that's what I would like to do um, following this, but uh, just become familiar with the study um, by reading this as well and taking a look at those elements. So you'll also read chapters 7 and 8 on survey and correlational research, um, and you'll take the quizzes for those chapters due by the end of this week. And then there is a discussion this week to explain the research measuring instrument that you are thinking of using for your research study. You, do, you probably don't have a final idea of exactly what you're going to do for your study yet, but um, it's good to start thinking about it. So this discussion will help to kind of force you to start thinking about your measuring instruments and what ones you might use. Have you read any literature in your lit review that you've done, which I will grade soon, by the way, either today or tomorrow? So have you read any literature there that they've used certain instruments? Or have you um, heard about any? Or do you want to make one yourself? You know, you want to propose to maybe make a, an instrument yourself that asks certain questions. Those are all valid options. Um, but so talk about it. What instruments are there? And what would you, um, what considerations should be made when you select an instrument for a research study? 
for my research study that I'm involved in that you'll help me with with the research activity. You know, we've chosen two instruments actually that are existing already and that have validation behind them. So I found two instruments that talk about technology self-efficacy and outcome expectations for technology use. And uh, they've already been used and validated by other authors and it's nice to be able to have instruments like those to be able to use myself because they again they've already been validated as quality instruments for collecting data. So that's the those are the activities for this week. I wanted to just share a word or two about survey research as I go through a little presentation that I've done in the past on this topic. So survey research um, is really a good way to get populations opinions uh, but you can test hypotheses about this. But remember, survey research can only go so far. Because people are self-reporting, they might report more highly of themselves or more highly of a program than they, than they might otherwise, than is the reality, right? And so you do have to worry about that. It's, it's opinions only. But you can test hypotheses with survey research. And uh, survey is an instrument that describes one or more characteristics of a population. But there are challenges with surveys as well, and that's one of the things we're going to run into with my research activity, is that there is going to be a, an issue with probably with sample size. Um, we might not get all the teachers to respond that I want to respond. I'm going to try to survey all the elementary school teachers in the Aberdeen School District, but I probably won't get a high response rate. Just people are busy, right? People doesn't have time for that, don't have time for that. And another trick is to write clear questions for the survey. In this case, though, I don't have to pilot study it too much because, and write those clear questions because I didn't write the questions. They've already been implemented by others. So that makes it a little easier. And there are different survey designs that you'll be reading about, um, cross-sectional, longitudinal, cohort, and panel, and follow-up surveys, and so forth. Um, as we look at surveys, the questionnaires are, are basically a survey type of research that asks questions, right? And they have items that can be structured or unstructured. Um, but for this research study that we're doing, we have to develop a cover letter, or an email anyway, that explains the purpose and significance of the study, and that shares some of the, uh, has some of the ethical concerns in the study as well. It reminds people that maybe they don't have to fill out the whole survey if they are uncomfortable with doing it. They can quit at any time and so forth. Those are ethical concerns and guidelines. Yes, we want as many people to fill out the survey as we can, but we can never force people to do so. Um, the ethical guidelines will not allow us to. And so, yeah, I would rather say, hey, you have to fill out my survey and don't don't submit some half-finished survey to me, but that's not ethical to do that. It's You've got to allow people to be done with the research, whatever research it is, when they're ready to be done, not when you want them to be done or allow them. And so other considerations when you're creating surveys are using appropriate sampling. In other words, choosing the right uh, sampling method that we've been learning about before for um, a population. And, of course, more respondents to a survey is more, equals more confidence in findings. And then you also want to make sure you, you can give plenty of reminders to your potential participants to fill out the survey. So in my IRB, you'll notice as you read that that I've actually allowed for three more reminder times, so three more reminder emails. I probably won't end up sending that many out, but we'll see. Um, that's quite a few, but I want to make sure that I remind people and say, come on, fill out the survey. And then uh, report the response rate, compare responses by demographics. So again, you want to take some demographics. Whenever you create a survey, there should be some basic demographics as part of that survey, such as in mine, there is the grade that you teach, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, kindergarten. Uh, how many years have you taught in the school? Some of these items might be kind of important for the study, and you can actually compare if they respond that maybe you can find that teachers who have only taught for a few short years actually um, tend to have higher technology self-efficacy than teachers who have taught for many years. And then maybe you can draw some conclusions based on that. So it's good to have some demographics and compare responses by those. So that's a little intro to survey research. And then correlational research. This one's always fun to talk about. 
Correlational research does something like this. Well, I'll go first to ice cream sales. So ice cream sales and temperature. This is something that I think some of the companies here in Aberdeen need to be aware of, that um, ice cream sales are go up as temperature goes up. And uh, so that's a correlational chart. That's a result of, a fine, of some research that's correlational research. It correlates ice cream sales with temperature. Uh, here's an example, miles per gallon and car weight. So most cars that weigh less up here on the upper left have better miles per gallon, right? Better MPG. And if the cars weigh more, they tend to have worse miles per gallon that they get. So again, this is a scatter plot. It's a result of a correlational research where they've taken the information of miles per gallon and car weight and put them in a plot. And then this is actually um, crickets. They tend to chirp faster when the temperature is higher. So that's an interesting one too. One thing to be aware of with this is that, of course, a correlation relies upon a large sample size as well. The larger the sample size, the better. The more people you can get to respond or more cars that you can figure out or more ice cream sales that you can find, the better your correlation. And there is a way to find statistical significance. And that just basically means can you, you can do some formulas to find out if there is a strong correlation between these two things and if the correlation is not just by chance. So let's take a look at some of these other items here. Um, and just thinking about this item here, for instance, there's size and age. One thing that you have to be aware of with correlational research and is a part of the theme of this class is that correlation is not causation. So in this case, let's see, size and age. You could say that size and age are very strongly correlated, right? There's some, there's some nice lines there. There's a nice line that goes in the scatter plot. Um, but what you can't say necessarily is that size causes age or that age necessarily causes size. Size causes age sounds a little more crazy than age causes size, right? Calorie intake and change in body weight. So again, this one's a nice correlation. You can say something like, the, as, as your body weight increases, your calorie intake is likely to increase too. Or as your calorie intake increases, your body weight is likely to increase. But you can't, from correlational research, say that your body weight is because or is caused by your calorie intake necessarily. Okay, there could be other factors that cause that to happen, but this is just saying as your calorie intake increases, your change in body weight increases as well. And this one is weight. Um, this was a uh, weight over a number of days within an exercise program, I think. But anyway, and here's why you can't say that um, correlation is not is causation. If you look at some of these. There is U.S. spending on science, space, with and technology, and suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Look at how well those correlate, right? But it's not, you know, you shouldn't tell the U.S. not to spend money on science, space, and technology because that's killing people, right? It's not necessarily the same thing. It's not causing it. Or number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. So we need to stop Nicolas Cage so that people don't you know, fall into the pool and drown. Those are highly correlated items, but they, uh, you know, one does not cause the other. So correlation is not causation. It doesn't cause something to happen necessarily. And so if you look at correlations of other things, you'll find examples as well. Just one last thought about this whole correlation, correlation versus causation thing. They get this wrong all the time in the media. Take a look at this article. Turns out counting on your fingers makes you smarter. So apparently, counting on your fingers causes, it's a causation thing claim made here that makes you smarter. But in fact, if you look down below and you read the study itself, let me close this ad here, you find that actually they just found, they correlated people who count on their fingers tend to be smarter. So it's not the counting on your fingers that makes you smarter. If you start counting on your fingers, it won't make you more smart. It's just that they correlated people who count on their fingers with people who are smart, or the people who do count on their fingers tend to be a little bit smart. And uh, so, again, the media gets this wrong all the time. 
this idea of correlation versus causation.